think when it comes to to some of the easiest things that people can do, it it usually comes down to, uh, unfortunately, taking a pill. (laughs) And so I know you might be going, what is she talking about? Well, um, you know, I, the, the micronutrient inadequacies is, is a, it's a widespread spread problem um, in the United States and, and other developed countries as well, where, you know, there's about 30 to 40 essential vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, amino acids that we have to get from our diet. And if we don't get them from our diet, we are going to be inadequate in them. And these essential micronutrients are doing very important things in our body from running our metabolism to making sure our enzymes, which are proteins inside of our cells that are basically doing all the work responsible for everything from pumping our blood to our immune function to neurotransmitter function. So basically everything, they require these, you know, micronutrients as cofactors. And um, it, it's it's definitely, I think, safe to say that diet food first approach and getting getting all your micronutrients from whole foods, eating diverse foods is paramount. However, um, many people, it's it, it, for whatever reason, they will not do that. Um, they're, you know, busy or they have a habit or there's, you know, other sorts of uh, dysregulation, perhaps in, in um, satiety mechanisms. And, you know, so getting getting some micronutrients like some of the important ones from a supplement and these are these are easy ones vitamin d vitamin d is an easy one um you know that's something that we usually make in our skin from the sun and about 70% of the us population has inadequate vitamin d and that's kind of defined as less than 30 nanograms per milliliter if you're in the united states if you're in europe that would you'd have to uh, multiply that by 2.5 but um, 70% of the U.S. population has levels below that, and there have been many different meta-analyses, you know, over the decades, you know, dating back all the way to the 1960s, looking at vitamin D levels and all-cause mortality. And it's it's you know pretty clear that having levels above 30 is associated with a lower all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality, in other words, people are less likely to die from. Um, non-accidental causes of death, whether that's cardiovascular disease. Although I would say cardiovascular disease is probably the weakest with respect to vitamin D. Cancer mortality is down, respiratory disease is down. Those are two of the really big ones, um, the big drivers with respect to lowering all-cause mortality. But um, so taking a, a vitamin D supplement is one of the easiest things to do. Why is the widespread deficiency you know, so common? Well, because we're inside in our cubicles and our offices at our, you know, techn- with our technological advances, computers, everything, we don't spend as much time outside, you know, doing agriculture, doing, you know, the sort of outdoors kind of um, jobs that, you know, that were common hundred years ago. So, so people are not making vitamin D from their skin. And on top of that, there are very, there are a variety of factors that actually, actually regulate whether or not we can make enough vitamin D in our skin. And that, you know, from everything from age, so a, a 70 year old person makes 20, like literally 25% of what they made as their 20 year old self. So it's very inefficient as you get older skin um, color. So melanin, that pigment that basically acts as a natural sunscreen also is a, you know, filter for UVB radiation, which is actually what needs to basically penetrate through the skin to start vitamin D three synthesis in the skin. So because melanin is a, you know, is a natural sunscreen, sunscreen also does that. People wear a lot of sunscreen nowadays. So there's, there's many different reasons why people are not getting as much vitamin D um, in our modern day world. And, and vitamin D is one of the, the cheapest and easiest supplements to take. Um, there have been studies that have basically tried to, to figure out like, how can you take a person who is deficient? So deficiency would be 20 nanograms per mil or less. And when you start to get less than 20 nanograms per milliliter, you start to go, you start to run the risk of, you know, bone problems and severe other types of severe problems, immune dysfunction, for example. Um, people that are deficient and supplement with about 4,000 IUs per day can bring their self up to a sufficient level, closer, you know, above 30 nanograms per mil, perhaps even closer to 40. And um, 4,000 IUs per day is actually the tolerable upper intake 
um, set by the Institute of Medicine for vitamin D3. And I just want to mention, you know, vitamin D is unique among the vitamins because it's actually, it gets converted into a steroid hormone. So vitamin D3 goes to the, to the liver. It's converted to a, another metabolite called 25 hydroxy vitamin D. That's the major circulating metabolite of vitamin D that's usually measured if you get a, a blood test. And then it goes to the kidneys where it's then converted into the steroid hormone. That's 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And what I mean by a steroid hormone, most people think about estrogen, testosterone, those are steroid hormones. Like imagine if 70% of the, you know, of men in the United States were deficient in testosterone, like they would be terrible. So, you know, vitamin D is, is, is basically very different because it basically can enter what's called the cell nucle uh, the nucleus of a cell. And that is where all your DNA is. And it can basically recognize this little sequence of DNA. And it um it's it basically, you know, binds to a receptor and you know, you know, it binds to your DNA and turns genes on, activates them, and turns other genes off and deactivates them in this like coordinated fashion. And these are genes that are important from everything from brain function. So serotonin is one. It's important for the synthesis of serotonin in the brain to immune function. And it's, it's why vitamin D plays such a critical role in helping prevent respiratory diseases. <music>